is not you coming to God with a shopping list. And you telling him, I want a redo today, a four-year-old. And you expect God to accept it and provide it for you, hook, line, and sinker. God is not an ATM machine. So prayer is not the ATM card that gets the cash to come out. Prayer is actually to conform us to the will of the master. So if what you are praying for is in line with the will of the father, that's when you get it. So the first key to praying effectively is to know what the will of God is concerning what you're praying for. Welcome to the anointed teaching preached at Church 316, the youth arm of the Founding of Life Church. We hope that you be blessed as you listen to this message. And some people are still here to jump in. So we'll take that song one more time just to give you enough. Enough to convince yourself that God is not a man. The reason he cannot lie is because he's not in his nature. God is not a man. The reason he cannot fail is because it's not in his nature. It's not because situation aligns in his favor. It's because it's not in his nature to fail. It can never, never exist. Oh, choir, help me sing. You do not lie. You do not fail. What is that for you to do? It doesn't exist. It can never, never Look at that issue in your mind and tell it. You do not God does lie, not lie. You do not fail. What is that for you to do? It doesn't exist. Oh. It can never, never exist. Oh. Father, we thank you. This is the confidence and the expectation in which we go into this week. Knowing that you are not a man, you cannot lie. You cannot fail, it's not in your nature. So with this understanding, we go into this new week, into this month, into this year, and we thank you that you will draw us deeper into you. That you cause the seeming big things that are making us take our eyes off you to lose significance and capacity and you help us to see you as who you are and you conform everything to the image and to the will of the father father we thank you we give you all the glory in jesus name we've worshiped amen god bless you you may be seated it's like we shouldn't stop right yes amen um we're going to i'm going to try and make it brief thank you so much choir god bless you awesome please give them a round of applause they don't just sing they are anointed very anointed for such a time as this and we thank god for their life amen, amen. um funny my theme for um, the the title god gave me for today is accessing god right our access to god i will start from philippians 4 now after i read this scripture i know a member of choir has a testimony that she's been wanting to share yes impromptu but i'm going to let her share it Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7, it says, Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. 
tell him every detail of your life, then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless the reading of the word. This morning we're going to be talking about prayer. Because I realized that one of the uh, most potent ways to get supernatural intervention is through prayer. Someone defined prayer as the currency of the unseen world. You see, everything that we see on this earth is already in heaven. The Lord's Prayer says, let your will be done as it is in heaven, not as it will be in heaven. It is in heaven. Your prayer brings it to manifestation on earth. So it's the currency of the unseen world. It's the oxygen of your spirit. The Bible says that God is spirit. And those that must worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If God is spirit and I'm supposed to converse with him, I have to do it in the spirit. And that's one of the things that prayer does for you. Okay, before we go further, I want her to share our testimony. Please give her a mic. Please welcome with me, Taiwo. Oh, Go ahead. Okay. You can come forward, so it's okay. easy. Hello, everybody. I must say that I'm super um, shocked that Pastor Rita um, chose to say, but I wasn't expecting this. I think I did. Yeah. So I'm a twin because my name is Taiwo. Can you so, hear her? I think her mic is low. So, um, yeah, I'm a twin. My name would have given me away. Um, so this year, um, I stay with my twin sister. Me and my twin sister have been rocking this adulthoodness. Uh, so we've been staying together, and then she, this January, she left. She moved somewhere else. So I've been by myself. And now I am working. I don't know if you guys heard when I was giving the talk about how I was working from somewhere. Now I'm doing something I love. So now I'm doing something that I love. I started working with this job in June of last year. Now it's great. But you see, I'm sure many of us are in that position where we're doing what we love, but it doesn't pay so much. So that was my story last year. I was enjoying it, but it wasn't paying me so much. But God's grace was sufficient, yeah? So this year, I started, especially with the fact like I was, I was by myself now, so I started praying to God for a turnaround in my finances. And so I started actively um, seeking for other jobs. I was aggressively seeking, sending my CDs everywhere. So one particular middle of the night, I think one particular middle of the night, I was praying, um, and I was going to send this CV to this place. So um, I was just about to send this, and then I realized that they needed me to write a cover letter, yeah? I was first upset, like, why am I writing a cover letter? But anyways, I drafted it. So while I was doing this cover letter, the Holy Spirit said, I should send this cover letter to my boss, who I currently work with. That's absurd. Like, how do you send a cover letter to somebody you're currently working with? He'll definitely know that I'm looking for a job, yeah? But I just did it anyway. It was after I now sent it, and I said, I can get myself, like, oh my God, what did I just do? But no, I know the way. So he looked at the cover letter, and then he called me. Then he says, what are you doing? Why are you applying for another job? I said, well, I mean, I love um, my work here. It's great and it's fantastic. But you see, I kind of need to, I need more. I need to earn more. And so it's not like I'm leaving, but I just want to have extra. So that very act of sending my um, cover letter now spawned this whole set of conversation where um, he ended up telling me about how, how, how much I'm valued and how um, the growth of, I'm instrumental in the growth of the company. It was just like, you know, when you're about to break up with somebody and the person is trying to fight for you, a person is begging you, please, baby, don't go. That's exactly how the conversation was. But, and then I now said, okay, God, I want to turn around in my finances, but anyways, I will bid you. And you, clearly, you don't want me to leave this place. There's a reason you want me to be here. So I'll just stay and... I'll, I'll just stay and still give, keep giving my best. So the next day he called me. And we're just talking about work normally. I noticed that normally he would call me in the mornings. Because uh, I work remotely, yeah? And he's in, he's in the UK. So he would call me in the morning normally and we set out our task. But I noticed that day he didn't call me so early. So I called him. I said, ah, how far? I hope nothing is wrong and everything. So, so he said, no, don't worry. Don't worry. You see, something's happening. Don't worry about it. So in my mind, it was just normal work. I was just working normally. Then he now says, so I'm going to check your email. So I checked my email. 
and then he says, um, dear Taiwo, congratulations, you have, ex you have shown excellent, I'm paraphrasing now, but he talked about how I've shown excellent dedication towards the work, and because of this, he's doubling my salary. So I ended up, so I ended up having barely little. I ended, I ended up having just enough to having more, to having overflow. And what struck in my mind was something as silly as sending your cover letter to your, to your boss that you're working with. Like, the thing that struck to me is that tiny, my, my miracle was hidden in that tiny act of obedience. If I just passed it, because, you see, when I, sent that, when I sent that cover letter, I called my brother. I said, oh my God, I think I've messed up. Like, can I send my, I just sent my cover letter to my boss. What's in his mouth, blah, blah, blah. He said, this is as how you guys relate now, no problem. So you can imagine if I reasoned and I allowed my reasoning to second guess what the Holy Spirit told me to do, I would have missed that thing. I know God is definitely doing something bigger, but then God was so mindful that he says, I'm doing something bigger, but just, just take this one to whole body first. Do you get that kind of thing? So it's just Hallelujah. profound that you see that, that, that the amount of blessing that is hidden in one tiny act of obedience, your next miracle is embedded in your obedience to God. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. So why did I take that testimony? We said here at Times Without Number, prayer is not a monologue. Prayer is not you coming to God with a shopping list. And you telling him, I want a way to do today, a four-year-old. -er and you expect God to accept it and provide it for you, Ukraine and Sika. God is not an ATM machine. So prayer is not the ATM card that gets the cash to come out. Prayer is actually to conform us to the will of the master. So if what you are praying for is in line with the will of the Father, that's when you get it. So the first key to praying effectively is to know what the will of God is concerning what you're praying for. And I like the way she explained. She talked about the goodwill, the, the, um, the permissible and the acceptable will of God. When you go to God in prayer, well, there are two ways to pray, right? There's one that you pray in your understanding and you pray in the spirit. Bible verses for that, 1 Corinthians 14 verses 15. It says, Paul was saying, he says, I will pray in my understanding and I will pray in the spirit. Right. And when you want to pray, you first have to know what the will of the Father is. 1 John 5 14 says, now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will. I think that sometimes Christians stop, from at, Christians stop at if you ask anything. And we forget that there is an according. And the according is the most important part. If not, it would have been omitted. According to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So my first question is, what is the will of God concerning what you're asking for? That will of God concerning it becomes the anchor, becomes the substance for your faith. Hebrews says now, faith is the substance of things of form. Is the evidence, the word of God that is the will of God that you know for that situation becomes the evidence. Evidence cannot be refuted in a court of law. That's the same way the evidence of the word of God concerning that situation cannot be refuted by the devil. But if you don't know that you have an evidence, you cannot present it in court. Now, the, the ignorance of the evidence or the lack of presentation of the evidence does not mean you will win the case. Do you understand what I'm saying? The fact that you don't know that you have an evidence, like the word, the fact that you are not even presenting it to God in prayer does not mean that things will fall on your laps. As a matter of fact, ignorance is very expensive. And you know what I realized? Ignorance is a seed. It germinates. 
Because if you go to a court of law and you cannot plead your case, you will still be declared guilty. Just the same way. God wants to give you this. It's his will, but you don't know it and you don't plead it. God cannot usurp himself. And another thing I found out, one of the reasons the devil fights our prayer life is because there is no way you will pray without getting into the word of God. How do you know the will of God? So it won't stop you from reading your Bible because the letter kill it. So you'll be reading it. How many people have ever read their Bible and you don't even understand what you're reading? It should have happened to you before. Uh -huh, before the Holy Spirit is not helping all of us. Because the letter alone can kill and that's why the strategy to reading your Bible is to pray first and ask the Holy Spirit to give you understanding. So the devil will not fight your prayer, your word life. Be reading it. It's like tell, tell us by moonlight or story time. Or you read songs of Solomon. It's like M and B. But he knows that once you can get to the point of prayer, you are connected to the source and then you get revelation that cannot be taken away from you. And when you get that revelation concerning what is yours, you know one of the things that God taught me said, be so a, someone that has a weapon, he has the weapon, but does not know he's not a dangerous person. Someone, that means you have read the word, you can quote it, you are not dangerous. Because all you have is have it. Someone that has it, knows that he has it, but does not know how to use it, is still not a dangerous person. You know the one that is dangerous? You have it. You know it. You know how to use it. As a matter there's one more. Someone that has it, knows that he has it, knows how to use it, and cannot even use it, or is too afraid to use it, is also not dangerous. So the devil is not afraid that you are coming to church. He will not stop the boss from coming. It won't stop you from joining choir. You will just be singing. It won't stop you from even joining RGK. All your dance is like Timaya dance. Koni power. It won't stop you from coming for ushering. Because as a matter of fact, when someone falls under the anointing, you carry them and the demon. And the demon says, I can't follow this one again. Let me follow you. And you don't even know it. So don't confuse your service to God as the power of God. It's not those that serve the Lord that will be strong and do exploits. It's not those that walk in the house of the Lord that will be strong and do exploits. It's those that know. So ask your neighbor, what do you know? What makes you powerful is the knowledge of what you are trying to get. The ability to wage it in the place of prayer. Because in this kingdom, Pastor said in the first service, we don't stop talking until we see the manifestation. So you keep saying it. You see, the woman with the issue of blood, how did she get her miracle? The Bible said she thought to herself. The Greek translation means she muttered to herself over and over again. She was saying to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. And she was moving, even in pain. And that's why I asked Finn the question, is the presence of problem the absence of God? It's not. Because even in the midst of the problem and the pain, she kept saying to herself, if I can just touch... And she took the next step. If I can just touch. And people were shoving her. But it didn't matter. Because she saw what she was going to get. And she did not allow the crowd. Do you know how many people were pulling at Jesus? None of them pulled power. Power, power was walking in their midst like this. And all of them were shouldering power. But none of them pulled power. Is it that none of them needed a deliverance? Was it that none of them needed power for their situation? She wasn't the only woman with a problem. But she was the only woman that knew who was standing before her. She was the only woman that knew what she could get from who was walking. And she was the only woman that was crazy enough to go for it. Jesus did not willingly release the power. Jesus did not say you are healed though before she got her healing. So it's not like Jesus willingly healed her. Jesus had no business with her healing. He was going about another mission.
but there is something about someone that knows and is not disturbed from going for it that will pull the power regardless of the intention of the carrier of the power. So Jesus' agenda was not to heal that woman with the issue of blood, but our agenda was whether you are coming for me or not, I'm getting something. How crazy are you this year to go for something, whether the master has it in his plan for you or not? Because I realize that a lot of times, Christians, we hinder ourselves in, it's the will of God, it's not the will of God. Just go for it first. Prayer. This year, there is nothing that is ours that will elude us in the name of Jesus. But you have to Okay, time. You have to know. James 4 verse 3 says, You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you might spend it on your pleasure. So you want to be effective in the place of prayer. You have to first of all know the will of God. Number two, you have to be persistent in prayer. The Bible says, let's open our Bibles to James 5 verse 16 says, Confess, I'm reading the Passion Translation. Confess and acknowledge how you have offended one another. Then pray for one another to be instantly healed. For tremendous power is released through the passionate, heartfelt prayer of a godly man. Elijah was a man with human frailties just like us. But he prayed and he received supernatural answers. He actually shut the heavens over the land so that there would be no rain for three and a half years. Do you think that the same God that did that cannot do what you are asking God for? But when you don't know, you cannot access. But when you stand in the place of prayer, you will definitely have to read your Bible so that you can know. I wrote in my note, who is prayer for everybody? It's not just for the pastors. You see, the laziness of our time is that we want a pastor to pray and prophesy over us. Do you know something else I discovered? Even for a prophecy, you have to pray it into manifestation. Do you think that because I say over you, you know the way God operates, God says the end of a thing from the beginning. So he sees you and he says, blessed. But you have just five naira in your pocket. Or maybe you don't even have transport fare. He sees you and says, like Gideon, Gideon, you are tired, you are small, you are the smallest in your clan, and he comes to say, oh, mighty man of valor. It does not make a sense. But God sees you, and because you are his child, he speaks to you as a God that you are, hoping that you will understand his language. Now, I have a son, right? My husband speaks Igala, because he's not Yoruba. I speak Yoruba. So... Because my son is with me more times, I speak Yoruba to him. So he has understanding of a little bit. Even though the way we say it, it's like English, Yoruba, but he shall have idea. Idea is there. Where I'm going to is, if my husband should speak Igala to him, even though he carries his DNA, because there is no constant conversation in that language, he will be confused. What happens to us is, God comes to you and speaks to you in a language. Now, because you don't have relationship to him, with him, to understand his language, we are confused and we allow our situations to make us anxious and depressed. And we look at our situation and we judge God unfaithful. Or we judge God as coming late. And God is saying, I'm speaking a language that you should understand because it's in your DNA. But the only reason you don't understand it is because there's been no fellowship. Remember, prayer is communication. The only reason my son understands Yoruba is because I communicate it to him regularly. So even if anyone else speaks to him, he understands what they're saying. If there is no place of communion or fellowship with God, when God comes and calls you blessed, instead of, instead of accepting that word as your reality, you accept your present situation as your reality. What happens when your now does not conform to the revelation of the word of God that he has given you? Do you then judge God lie or judge God unfaithful? Simply because your present does not look like what he has said. 
or you acknowledge the presence and tell it, this is not to the end. Because I understand the language of my father. And if he calls me blessed, it's just a matter of time. Hebrews 6 says, through patience and faith, they obtain the promise. You understand, I will be patient, but my substance, my faith is on the revelation that God has given unto me. So what has God said unto you? I want us to close before 12. What has God said to you? According to his will, we should be um, fervent in prayer. We should be persistent. In this kingdom, you say it until you get it. Until your situation conformed to the word of God. Like that woman with the issue of blood, she did not stop muttering it until she touched him and she got her healing. I bet if she touched him and she didn't get her healing, she would have just died here. Because she's made up her mind that we die here. That's what happened to Jacob. The first time God showed up to Jacob, because there was no constant communication and fellowship, he did not even know God was there. He had a sweet sleep. You will not sleep the sleep of death in Jesus' name. God was present and he did not know it. But the second time God came, he said, ah, ah, you fool me once, shame on me. If you fool, no, shame on you, Abby. You fool me twice, shame on me. Jacob said, no. I will not just know that you are present. I will hold you till you bless me. Because I know that your presence does not come empty. When God is present, when God intervenes, when God shows up in a matter, he doesn't leave it because God does not walk alone. He walks with glory. The Bible says that everywhere, not somewhere, everywhere Jesus went, he was doing good. So even though he was in the midst of the crowd, they did not understand that goodness was in their midst. But the woman with the issue of blood knew that in his DNA is the fact that everywhere he shows up to, goodness must show up. Now, whether you welcome goodness or not, it's up to you. So she decided that she wasn't going to miss the moment. That's one of the things that prayer does. It opens your antenna to the moment and helps you to seize it. Because she was muttering to herself, she was able to seize the moment. Another thing for effective prayer is your ability to believe. Even when you don't see it, you just believe it. You trust that he who has said it is able to do it because God is not a man. So I said I was going to talk about the benefits of prayer and then I'll talk about the types of prayer and we will round off. Now there are different types of prayer. The one that we are most familiar with is petition, right? God, I want, I need, I am, my family, my children, my husband, which is great, right? As long as it's according to his will, they would do it. But I just wanted to um, emphasize another kind of prayer. Because I was reading my Bibles in um, Ezekiel 2.22. One second. Um, I started talking about it last week. About intercession. intercession. Ezekiel 22 verse 30 says, I looked for someone among them who will build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not destroy it. But I found none. So we are, used, we are okay with petition, right? And that's why I'm not emphasizing more on it because you know, that's normal. The one I want to focus on a bit today is our ability to intercede. Our ability to look beyond our needs and focus on the need of others. Because oftentimes what you pray for God to do for another, he will make it happen for you. But we are too blinded sometimes by what we need or what we don't have that we are not then able to intercede for others. You know, the book of Job 42 verse 10, Job prayed for his friends even when he was lacking. He didn't need to pray for himself for there to be a restoration. The Bible says that after Job prayed for his friends, all that he lost was restored to him. He didn't have to pray for his friend. I've said that to say, some of the things that we are asking for is inched upon us interceding for others. And God is trying to say, I need you to get out of yourself a little bit. If you get out of yourself, I will make it happen. But you are too focused on me, myself, and I. So Job, he was going through pain. When he was praying for his friends, he was still leprous. When he was praying for his friends, he still had all the boys and all of that all over him. 
But in spite of his pain, he took time to intercede for his friend. For a minute, I want you to ask your neighbor, what do you want me to pray for? And just say a word of prayer. Just tell your neighbor. If you don't have any neighbor, look for your neighbor. Tell the person what you want them to pray for. Once your neighbor tells you, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost and intercede for that neighbor. Let's practice what we have learned. Don't pray for yourself. You are praying for your neighbor. Whatever your neighbor has told you, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost and intercede for your neighbor that there will be a manifestation. Pray like you are praying for yourself. That this my neighbor, this thing I'm praying for my neighbor for, my neighbor will come back next week with a testimony. Pray selflessly. If you don't have a neighbor, for me, there's someone over there that doesn't have a neighbor. Pray for someone. Hold, you know, if you can't hold, you don't have to hold the person's hand, but just intercede for the person and say that you will come back with a testimony in the name of Jesus. Whatever the neighbor is believing God for, begin to intercede. The Bible says that wherever two or three shall agree as touching anything on earth, it will be done. So we are looking beyond ourselves in today's service and we are interceding for our neighbor and even for our online family. We are praying that the word of God will mightily grow and prevail over any situation they are facing. In the name of Jesus, Makatolo Bausaha, Ikanda Rabaka Setele, Brodo Suta Handa, Mayege, Dege, 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 we, sort of, we, we join our faith together in the name of Jesus. We pray that God will come through for us speedily. In the mighty name of Jesus, we intercede for ourselves this morning. And we decree that there will be a manifestation of all, all that you are believing God for. In the name of Jesus, decree that your neighbor will come back with a testimony next week. In the name of Jesus, that the testimony will be such that there will be no time to preach a message. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, we thank you. Let's begin to thank God for these testimonies. We give you praise. Father, we thank you. Blessed be your holy name. As we have decreed it, so shall it be. In Jesus' name, amen. The power of intercession. And you know, God will prove it to you if you really, from your heart, intercede from your neighbor. They will come back and share the testimony with you. So tell your neighbor that they should look for you and share the testimony when it comes. Right? They should, yes. Because there will be a manifestation of the word of God in our lives in Jesus' name. God is looking for intercessors. People that will. And you know one of the benefits of intercession? When you begin to pray for others, you become a friend of God like Abraham. God said, can I keep a secret from my friend Abraham? God knows the end from the beginning. So he knew before telling Abraham that Abraham will intercede for Sodom and Gomorrah. When God identifies you as an intercessor, he will reveal secrets and mysteries to you. Sometimes the reason God does not reveal certain secrets and mysteries to us is because they do not relate to our purpose and destiny. And he knows that if I bring you into that revelation, you will not look beyond yourself to pray to manifestation. So by our acts of not being intercessor, we limit our revelation to all that we need for our life and our purpose. Because God does not waste resources. If he knows that if I show you the secret of healing, even though you, will, you, can, act, you can access that gift anyway, but I have not called you specifically to the healing ministry. But if I reveal that secret to you, you won't just say, ah, headache, go. After headache, that's it. He knows that you will see someone else that is sick and that revelation will pull something on the inside of you that will make you intercede for that person based on the revelation that you have. If he knows that he can trust you like that, then he will reveal to you. He didn't have to tell Abraham anything. Abraham did not ask him, where are you going? Where are you coming from? He's the one that said, I can't do this without telling you. And God is looking for such friends this year. Friends that he will say, I can't do this without telling you. It doesn't concern you, but blessing is going through something. Let me tell, let me tell Oyinkon because Oyinkon will be able to stand in the gap and hold blessing up. And then your eyes of understanding is being enlightened. I found it interesting that 12 disciples walked this life with Jesus. Yet, someone that was not alive, when, that was not with Jesus when he was on earth, was the one that had enough revelation to write two-thirds of the scripture. 
it tells you that proximity does not mean revelation. There are some disciples that we can't find the scriptures that they wrote. I, I, I know because I went on Google. I was searching for it. Even Timothy, that was the right hand of Paul, he had to write First Thessalonians in collaboration with somebody else. Proximity is not anointing. Neither is proximity in revelation. It was close to someone that had so much depth. Maybe we write the third, third testament. I don't know if there will be anything like that. But Intercession. Oh yeah, time, time, time. Okay, and the final one will be prayer of agreement. Matthew 18, okay, no, that's the second to the last one. Matthew 18, verse 19 says, amplified, it says, Again, I say to you that if two believers on earth agree, that is, are of one mind in harmony about anything that they ask within the will of the Father, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. It was said of those that were building the Tower of Babel, they did not have the Holy Spirit. But it says that because they are of one mind, it said there is nothing that they imagine to do that will not happen. When you are able to come into agreement with someone and pray with that person. And that's why I said we should, order, we should pray for each other. Not just intercede, but then you agree. That one was intercession because you were praying for the person. Prayer of agreement is both of us praying for the same thing. The Bible says, forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled, not on earth. There's no settlement on earth yet. It's settled in heaven. You want it to be settled on earth. It's prayer that brings that riches from heaven to earth. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus went to the Mount to pray, the Bible says that as he prayed, the heavens opened. And Moses and Elijah came to buffet him. When you pray, you bring up over, open heavens over your situation. When you pray, you transform. You alter the physical nature of your situation. The Bible says that as Jesus was praying and conversing with uh, Moses and Elijah, the disciples said the clothes on his body started to glow. He said it was white in the place of prayer. And then the final one will be thanksgiving. I thought on thanksgiving, I think, a couple of weeks ago. So intercession, petition, agreement, and thanksgiving. So what are the benefits of prayer? I'm going to end with this. First of all, it makes tremendous power available. Prayer gives you an insight into the heart of the Father because you know what his will is. Prayer helps us to align to the will and to the intention of the Father. So you go to God and you are praying for this. And because you are praying a heartfelt and passionate prayer, you are listening as God begins to... How many people have ever tried, have ever started praying for something and in the place of prayer, you find yourself saying something else? I don't know, it's happened to me. Maybe I'm praying for, let's say Pastor Shoba has offended me and I'm like, no, Shoba has offended me. And after I began to pray that God bless Shoba and I'm like, no, this is not why I came here. My heart was to report him to you. And I don't know why I'm blessed. I'm praying for him. And I'm saying, God, help him. And one day I asked you, but how far? He said, ah, you know, I was really going through something and God helped me. I said, ah, is this how you used to do? That's the power of prayer. It helps us to align to the will of the Father. I don't mean that one that you are praying because they say you should pray. You know that there is lazy prayer. As a matter of fact, speaking in tongues helps us to be lazy. Let us pray. Oh, you come. I like your hair. Oh, fine, God. I bow straight. I will buy you. I like your clothes. Give me now. Give me now. Give me now. That one will not, it's not going anywhere. It's only you. You are just, you are doing mouth exercise. Bible says the effectual, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man makes power available. So you know if you want power to be available you cannot be distracted like that. Amen. Okay, yes, yes, yes. I'm going to, I'm rounding off now. Prayer gives us strength. When Jesus was going to the cross and he was getting tired he went to pray. And the Bible says that God strengthened him. Right? When you are beginning to weak 
Bible says that men ought always to pray and not faint. If you are beginning to faint, that's, your tank is just showing you empty, empty, empty. You need to refuel, right? And you refuel in the place of prayer. Prayer helps us get out of trouble, James 5.13. Prayer helps us refocus. When you are praying, you are having a conversation with the Father. If I was talking to you, and I was, okay, let me practice. If I was talking to Bisola Adetola, and I'm looking at Shobo, and I say, hey, Bisola, how are you? Bisola, how are you now? None of them is answering. Shobo is asking me, am I Bisola? And the person that I'm even calling her name, even the maker is not even helping that, maybe it's me. Even though it's their name, they will not answer to it. Now, if you are talking to God and you are that distracted, who are you talking to? So if human being can be confused as to who you are speaking to, the purpose of prayer is to refocus our attention to the Father and understand what his will is and what his intent is and pray that until the, we see the manifestation. Like I said, prayer helps us to... In, Prayer increases our knowledge of the word of God. The final thing that prayer does, it goes into the future and prepares for you. Except you are a, a witch. You don't know what will happen tomorrow. But your prayer can go into your tomorrow to prepare it for you. I've said that to say, this is our month of supernatural intervention. The much that you see is up to you. Remember, the one that has power and does not know it, and does not use it, is not dangerous. I pray that God will help us to be dangerous weapons in his hand. In Jesus name.